Hi, Grzegorz. Could you please introduce yourself, especially in the context of your investment experience? Hello. Uh, well, my name is Grzegorz Link. Uh, I come from a physics background. I studied physics. Uh, but I was, since I was a little boy, I was interested in, in, in the stock market. I, I think it's uh, the pop culture of the 90s <laughs> imprinted on me uh, a vision that you could uh, make money on the stock market passively uh, or maybe actively, but just selecting stocks once in a couple of months. And, and that's how you could make money. So I had this dream when I was a boy that I could uh, make money on the stock exchange and I could uh, use my time on research and physics studies. And uh, since then, it's a, a long way, uh, and I've learned that it's not so easy to make money on the stock market. It's, it's possible, but it's not very, very easy. So, but also I've I've learned that there are very interesting re research um, questions in the financial investing landscape. So that's when uh, I decided, I think, somewhere in the middle of my studies to to start investing, and then gradually I just um, ventured in this into this investing world uh, even further further so after finishing my um, master of science uh, i've decided to work for an investment company and today i'm still working for the same company it's an investment fund, a fund here in poland it's called apoka tfi and it's fully and I, quantified right yes 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 and what i do there is is uh, in a quantitative uh, uh, investment fund um, I think it's one of the first in Poland, but it's uh, first. It's um, definitely the first to continually um, continue to this day because there, there were a couple of those, but they shut down a couple of years ago. So we are the first uh, investment fund still uh, working in Poland uh, quantitatively, and uh, the first one uh, focused solely on equities and a little bit of futures around the equity market. Okay, and while you were uh, while you were studying physics, uh, you had a great exposure to mathematics and to programming, which I believe now is the main uh, skill set you're using uh, while you are working for the fund. Could you please, for the rest of our listeners and uh, and people who are uh, on the other side, explain? What is a quantitative approach to investments? Because uh, maybe it's not that obvious that someone who was studying physics now is uh, just involved in investment world. Okay, so exactly as you said, uh, learning programming uh, during my studies was, I think, one of the most um, useful uh, tool that I've learned for the um, business uh, world. Uh, but also, I'd say that physics studies are great for uh, future careers because they um, they imprint on you a kind of uh, curiosity about the world, and and that solving hard problems can be fun. You can uh, they, they teach you how to um, chop down th these problems into smaller pieces. So even something like quant uh, quant uh, quantum physics can be uh, learned by maybe not everyone but most people it can be understood so that's that's one of the useful um, things i've learned there and um, a quantitative ap approach is mainly data driven so most um, financial uh, investors are uh, discretionary so they uh, analyze um, i don't know company spreadsheets they they analyze uh, company data company meetings and so on and they come to a conclusion that this company is a good company this company is uh, let's say too expensive and th this one is a good one to invest in and the uh, quantitative approach uh, focuses on totally on um, objective data that is available so one of the i think most popular right now uh, quantitative approaches is, is uh, momentum investing like all right uh, all right uh, so so what what you do there is uh, you, you take a list of all the stocks in the stock market, you uh, filter them, you, you list them from the, uh, from the biggest momentum of, of, of the recent price to the, to the, to the least, and you invest uh, in a systematic way in, in let's say, the, the top 10 stocks, and, and, and you rebalance once, once a month or once, uh, once a quarter. And that is an example of a quantitative approach. Okay, which I believe, and we will uh, get to that topic later, 
has also some behavioral advantages because maybe you can uh, take your decisions based on uh, data rather than emotions. Although yeah. it's easy to say, it's harder to do it. Um, but uh, what you are exactly doing uh, um, for your fund? I mean, you are designing some new models or you are just uh, paying attention to execute the model as expected as expected on the market what what you are uh, what what, well, my, what do you do my journey is quite a long one because i'm working there for seven years already so at the beginning i was uh, mostly focused on automating processes because when i came into the fund uh, um, some work that was done mainly by hand uh, could be upgraded via uh, some programming knowledge I had C++ and Python knowledge, so this was very useful. So at the beginning, I just automated some processes. Uh, then it, um, it, it became apparent that uh, some of the information processes, the, the information analysis about stocks can also be automated. And, and also we had from the beginning of my working there, the, in the back of our heads, an idea that maybe a fund around this, a, a, a purely quantitative fund, around these tools that we are making for discretionary uh, traders and investors could be used and the, and the fund could um, start to exist. And it happened about three years after my work there that we started, uh, three or four years, we started uh, uh, the fund, it's called ApocaQuant. And uh, from then on, we are still uh, evaluating these models. We are, um, adding to them a little bit, but it's mostly uh, research around some data-driven uh, models and, uh, like you said, uh, maintaining those models. So every day you have to also check the correctness for data right. and things like that. So, so, so this is mainly my job now, but uh, formally I'm a, I'm a portfolio manager there. All right. And uh, just to be um, more precise, this is only for the Polish market, right? So you are not investing on uh, international markets? No, we, we are in, investing in internationally, but mainly it, it's the Polish market. We are focused mainly on, on Poland and uh, Central Europe, but there are some algorithms that we are using also for the international market, uh, mostly the, the future-oriented one, because equities right now is, is only Poland. And the futures uh, algorithms, because we have, I don't know, five or six main algorithm, algorithms that are um, part of the, of the main model, then some of these are focused on the international market and they invest in international futures. And do you see any difference in the market efficiency between Poland and international markets, especially the markets which are very popular, like in the United States, for example? Do you think that from a quant perspective, uh, there is some difference, uh, advantage or disadvantage. Uh, how do you see that? Def definitely, yes. I, I, I totally agree. It's, uh, I think it's usually the case that the less, um, hmm, the less fluid the market is, there are more uh, advantages for active investing. So Poland is a very small market. I think it comprises about 0.3 or 0.4% uh, of the total the market value of, of all the stock markets in the world. So there are a lot of opportunities, but I have to say that from in a lot of these models that use, for example, some behavioral advantage. So, so example, for example, this, this systematic approach, uh, even the, the developed markets like the US or the UK or, or Germany are, are still very investable for an active manager. So it all, it depends on your time horizon because, for example, high frequency trading is very popular. That was very popular in the U.S. Uh, I'm quite sure that we had we would have no chance to compete with American companies because they've it's it's a very hard space to compete in. There, there are a lot of competitors, but uh, probably in Poland it would be a lot easier. But we are not so, so totally not uh, focused on high frequency trading. I would say it's more medium or even low frequency trading for us. So in that time horizon, I think there is totally no problem with with investing in the uh, international stock markets, even even from a country uh, from the from from Central Europe like here. 
On your website, I found a great presentation uh, you you put, and it's titled "How Can a Widely Known Investment Strategy Still Work in and Be Profitable?" And I would like to use this as a background for our uh, discussion today. So I will put it here so that other can see that. And I think it's a it's a great material to go through because you put there a lot of um, uh, thoughts uh, from your perspective about investing. And you are mentioning there, for example, that there are there is a common myth about investing that the smartest guy in the room wins, and it and it seems to be natural that if someone is smarter, then should have a better results on the market. Whereas you say that this is a myth. Could you please explain how how it how it can be? Well, the. Uh, the First of all, the, the presentation was uh, intended for, um, I, I've presented it on the Faculty of Physics on the University of Warsaw, so it might be a little bit uh, harder uh, in the statistics uh, um, part. But uh, the main idea I think I, I've got from two people, actually. Uh, the One is Michael Mabusen. Uh, he's the uh, author of a book, I think, The Success Equation, but in general, he, he's a professor of finance. He works in the investment industry, has a lot of experience. And one of his mm, uh, main ideas in this uh, book I've, know, uh, I've quoted is that uh, a lot of the things people do, a lot of the professional uh, things people do, can be put somewhere on a continuum between total uh, skill, like, for example, in this chart, you see that chess is selected as a total skillful uh, um, profession to total luck, uh, like playing the roulette, the other side of the spectrum. And somewhere on the spectrum there is investing, and uh, Mr. Mabusan argues that investing is a lot uh, closer to, uh, to luck than to skill. Uh, that doesn't mean skill isn't important, it's very important, but, but luck plays a great role. And this, I think, uh, is one of the drivers behind the, the hypothesis I, I, I give here that uh, very often, unlike in professional fields like medical um, professions or, or, or physics studies or, or other things like that, being the smartest doesn't help you very much. Uh, the, the, you, you also have to have something that I call street smart. So um, you have to feel uh, you have to have great experience with the uh, field you are uh, investing in. And uh, this was my experience also observing other people that uh, very often the best investors I've, I've um, met along the way uh, were not actually the smartest guys, but they were very uh, street smart, I'd say. So they, 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 they were very fluent in, in, in what they were doing even maybe not understanding perfectly everything they are doing. So, um, yeah. All right. But if you are uh, using a quantitative approach to investing, which is, let's say, closer to book smarts rather than street smarts, because you're just uh, building a model and then your task is to follow it and to execute that model on the market. Do you think that uh, then in quantitative approach, uh, the book smarts, has more, let's say, sense and also is helping to manage that randomness on the market, which is, uh, you know, we cannot avoid it, but but we have to face it. So do you think, in other words, that being a quantitative is helping in some way to um, to handle that randomness on the market? Yes, I, I totally agree, but um, I think it's, uh, it's less about being uh, um, very smart in the systematic approach because the systematic approach or the quantitative approach can be very, very simple. It doesn't have to be a very complicated algorithm model. It, it can sometimes be something as, as simple as passive investing. There's uh, being it's, uh, very popular right now in Poland, but uh, you just invest in an ETF and you do it systematically and so on. So it, it doesn't have to be complex. It's not about the very complex part. It's mostly about um, avoiding very big mistakes because uh, as I think there's a um, quote by Charlie Munger uh, that um, um, I, I, I think I'm using it somewhere in the presentation that we, uh, that there's a great deal uh, of uh, money we've made not by being smart, but by not being stupid. And <laughs> that's what a quantitative approach uh, gives you that 
you avoid uh, making very, very big mistakes that discretionary investors sometimes uh, uh, make, but not always. You can also learn to avoid these mistakes by discretionary trading. It's, it's entirely possible. But I think the systematic approach gives you a, a little bit of a fail-safe mechanism. It, it, it prevents you from making these large mistakes. All right. So if investing is so difficult and we are exposed to random events which we cannot control, do you think then um, that um, passive investment <clears throat> makes sense? Just rather, uh, I mean, just to give up and uh, not to beat, uh, try to beat the market, but just follow the market and buy the whole market, as Jack Bogle said, rather than uh, just uh, rather than looking for a needle in a haystack, just to buy the whole haystack. Um, so, first of all, do you think that passive investing makes sense, and where is the border between the active and passive investing? Definitely, it, it makes sense, but I'd say not for all investors. It, 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 uh, it very much depends on your psychology. Uh, psychology it depends uh, on the time you can spend analyzing the market and so on and so on. For, for example, I don't use passive investing. Uh, I'm focused entirely on active investing, but I think it's very useful for people, for example, that uh, are not interested in the stock market. They don't want to check the prices of everything uh, daily and so on. Uh, so it does make sense. The difference, I think, whenever you, uh, regarding your second question, uh, whenever you venture into um, some some kind of timing the market, you, whenever you say, okay, I don't want to regularly uh, buy the same tranche uh, uh, of, a, of a dollar value of, of the stock market, I want to wait for a moment because right now the stock market is expensive and I will invest when, when there will be a drawdown then whenever you think like that, you are venturing into active investing. And I think it's it, it's okay, but you have to be very careful in, in active investing because you have to watch out for the big mistakes. But for me, whenever you, you make some kind of decision um, of, of, of timing, some kind of uh, decision of uh, selecting some, some specific stocks over the uh, uh, market index, then you are venturing into active investing. Okay, how about then um, so-called factor ETFs? Because the factor investing becomes also very popular. So from the perspective of an investor, it seems like it's a passive approach because you can just buy and hold such such ETF, uh, let's say with the exposure to momentum factor or uh, to the value factor. But on the other hand, behind the scene, there is more uh, happening. And in fact, uh, um, it seems like it's an active strategy. So it's a kind of a hybrid. How do you see that? Is it still passive or is it already active approach? Although the facade, let's say, is, uh, is passive. Well, exactly like you said, it's, it's a hybrid. Uh, so I'd say when there's pure passive somewhere here and pure active somewhere there, then it's a blend somewhere in the middle. For me uh, personally, it's 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 active investing. It, it's just a rebranding. It's just uh, a rebranding of active investing, but done in a very systematic uh, way, which is I think very useful. So I think it, it it has its merits, and I would definitely recommend using it uh, for a more conscious investor. But for me, it's already active investing because even though you are doing it systematically, you are you are selecting some stocks. You are you are trying to beat the market. And history suggests, uh, research suggests that uh, it works, yes? The value investing, for example, or, uh, or momentum investing, it is useful in the long term, but it is already active uh, management and like every uh, investment approach, even the passive approach, uh, you will have to uh, live through some drawdowns and you will have to survive this volatility, this, these drawdowns, and you have to be consequent. And if you are disciplined and still investing, like. The, the, a great example right now is value investing that is uh, being beaten right now for 10 years or, or more. And everyone is, um, is thinking, is, is value investing dead? Does this method not work anymore? And so on. So in each type of uh, investment method, you experience these periods uh, and you have to survive them. Right. Um, so if we would talk about the so-called edge of an active investor, how to beat the market or is it even possible to consistently beat the market um, because uh, active investing is quite often criticized and uh, therefore uh, we have passive investing that 
the active strategies quite often fail. And as you mentioned, the value uh, factor, even for a very extensive period of time, uh, which can be very discouraging for investors. And then that's why maybe they go towards passive approach, because at least even if they don't beat the market, they are guaranteed to capture what the market brings. Of course, uh, in theory, because still even being a passive investor is not that easy and you can and you can do some stupid things. But in theory, at least you can capture what the market gives you. So do you think that um, because for sure you believe that we can beat the market, you wouldn't work for the fund. But uh, but do you think it's possible to do it consistently? As you said, I do believe it's possible. Uh, if you, we could show one of the charts I've shown here from, from the presentation. Uh, there are two charts here. Uh, on the left, there's um, a percentage uh, of funds that is outperforming uh, the, the market index, so let's say passive investing. Uh, uh, and on the right, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a correlation shown when, um, when the market index has a specific return, that is the uh, horizontal axis. Uh, then um, what is the uh, um, median fund return? And that's on the vertical axis. And what you can see on both of these uh, charts very clearly is that active investing usually outperforms. Because uh, one more maybe comment, that when the, the, the uh, dots are red on the right chart, then active investment is worse than passive investing. And when the dots are black, uh, it usually it means that this is uh, an uh, overperformance. And, and active uh, investment usually outperforms uh, during bad markets. Uh, it, it, it isn't a rule. You could also have funds that do very badly, uh, active, uh, actively managed funds that do very badly in a, a down market. But usually uh, there's this notion that in uh, the industry is called risk adjusted return. So, because uh, there are a lot of investors that, uh, for example, when you are a young investor, you, you don't have very, very uh, much capital. Uh, you are concerned mainly with uh, big returns. You, you don't mind uh, weathering big drawdowns and so on. When you are uh, an older investor, you have a family, you have, I don't know, so, so, some kind of estate. You are usually more concerned with avoiding drawdowns than with uh, having very big returns. Of course, the bigger the returns, the better. But but you would, for example, prefer a strategy that has uh, a three times uh, uh, smaller drawdown, but uh, uh, just a little bit less market return. So so what this chart shows is that active investment usually un uh, outperforms uh, when the market is bad, when there is a, a drawdown in the market index and, and the passive strategy is usually the worst then. But also, I think in the long run, active returns, uh, if, if, if the fund is good, the, the active uh, investment uh, method, I think, will outperform. Even in the smart uh, beta uh, uh, factors that, that, that you mentioned earlier, I think uh, there's one of the charts in the end, uh, near the end of this presentation, that, uh, that in the long run, each of these factors, momentum, value, quality, uh, did outperform the market. Okay, um, I will uh, put the link to that presentation so everyone interested can just uh, go uh, through it afterwards. And in, in your presentation, you're talking about also the so-called skewness of returns. And uh, I would like to avoid uh, using too difficult terms here and to <laughs> discourage people for listening to us. But if you could, in some simple way, explain what it is and how it impacts um, let's say the behavioral aspects of investing because it has some impact on how we uh, follow the strategy depending on uh, how this uh, skewness of returns is uh, characterized okay so first of all when there's the active versus passive debate people uh, uh, are constantly fighting and this happens for decades uh, is the market effective uh, and uh, very very random so this is the effective market theory uh, uh, or is it uh, not n not efficient uh, uh, and you can have um, some kind of alpha on the market and you can have some active management uh, uh, positive returns and 
I think what this debate misses is that even if the market is random, uh, there, there are very different types of randomness. Uh, this is something you, you learn, for example, on physics or mathematics studies, that uh, there are different uh, distributions of randomness. Everyone knows the Gaussian distribution, it's, it's a bell-shaped curve, but there are also very, very different types of distributions. And, and a lot of the uh, physical um, phenomena we observe, and also the financial phenomena, uh, um, follow different distributions. So, for example, this, this chart I've shown here is this um, is uh, returns for the S and P 500 index for about 100 years. It, it's a little bit um, uh, there's some cheating here because the S and P 500 uh, exists from 1955. So, so for the earlier years, some some other index has been uh, stitched here together. But what you can see here is that uh, the the, the um, Mm, distribution of returns isn't a bell shape. It, it, it isn't symmetrical. It's uh, um, moved a little bit to the right. So uh, the, the 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 median, let's say the the mean return for the market is positive, but there is also a larger uh, um, left tail. So so you can have a, a a very very bad year. I think this is for the 1930s. So so when the the great market crash. Uh, happened. So uh, what we see here is that this uh, distribution is not symmetrical. It is skewed, and this uh, measure of how much skewed it is is called skewness. This is, for example, a, a, a simple diagram of uh, showing what is negative skew and what is positive skew. And this skewness uh, we observe in uh, very different financial uh, instruments. For example, uh, I'll skip here uh, some of the slides showing um, also interesting things. But 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 let's see here. Uh, maybe yeah, th this is a good chart. It so it shows uh, uh, how different asset classes have different skewness, and this is uh, um, not all asset classes are here, and this is uh, maybe not quantitatively done. It's it, it's uh, it's a little bit of hand waving, but you can see here that uh, for example, shorting put strategies, so option strategies, can have very high return but have a very negative skew. So what we've seen here uh, on the, they, they have a very large tail on the left side. And for example, you could have uh, stock market strategies that have a very uh, positive skew. So mm, what, there's a known phenomena uh, there that most uh, stocks in the long run uh, do not make money. So uh, when you take a, a market index, uh, the percentages, the, the percentage of stocks that that uh, um, amounts to the return of the index is uh, smaller than 50 percent, and, and um, this is an example of the of the positive skewness. So, so yeah, skewness is is an important uh, co concept, and and what I'd like you to remember is that uh, different asset classes have different distributions of returns, and these distributions affect. Uh, what our returns will be and, and, and how we will be managing uh, those returns. So to summarize, we can say that, for example, stocks, as we can see from that chart, it has a, a negative skew, which means that mostly we make some money and uh, more often we make money than we lose, but there is a, um, a fat uh, on the tail on the left side where we sometimes occasionally and rarely than we think, we may lose quite a lot. Like you said, 1931, there was like 40% or something, the loss within a single year. On the other hand, we have a lottery, and that's totally on the other side, where mostly we do lo uh, have losses, but occasionally, very occasionally, we have some a big win um, transaction, let's say. So this is mm -hmm. uh, maybe a kind of a comparison on two different sides. So what, what do you think from the behavioral point of view is easier or if we can even define it that way for an average investor to have it, uh, to have the strategy which is having a negative skew or the positive skew or it's hard to say exactly. It, it may work differently for different people. I'd say it's hard to say. If you are an active investor, uh, there are very different types of people. So some very much uh, like positive skew. They, they they can manage this this state when you lose money most of the time, but you win once a very very high amount. Uh, 
Uh, others uh, are very, um, I'd say, risk averse, and they they don't want to experience something like that. So it, it it very much depends. But I think in general, people maybe forget a little bit about the skew effect, and, and most people think that it's very symmetrical. The, the returns are very symmetrical. So I think in an ideal world, uh, most people would prefer a symmetrical uh, um, distribution with the skew zero. So. But I'm just guessing. Okay, okay. This is more a question to psychologists, I think. Um, you say within your presentation that trading and investing is mainly about correct decision making in an environment of uncertainty. Um, and you say that uh, this uncertainty is even something more than just risk, which we can describe in a mathematical way. Uh, could you please explain more uh, what, what what you what you uh, meant exactly saying by that? Okay, so um, th there's a good example of uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, he was the Secretary of Defense uh, of the United States uh, during the uh, I think 9/11 uh, uh, terrorist attacks. And after that, he uh, he said something. I think it was publicly. He had a, a public presentation that uh, something in the uh, in the way that there are things there are known knowns. So there are things we know we know. There are known unknowns. So there are things we know that exist, but we don't know any. Uh, we don't know about them. We we know that there is some kind of risk. We know that this could happen, or or so on, but we don't uh, know when it will happen. But there are also unknown unknowns, and this is the definitely the the largest part of reality, uh, the the part where black swans, for example, the, a popular term uh, exists. And uh, this is the distinction I've made here about uncertainty and risk. This is a little bit of a philosophical uh, um, question, actually. Uh, what is the difference? But in general, my understanding is that risk is uh, all the uh, known unknowns. So all the things we know that can happen and we can make a model predicting what is the chance that they will happen and we can avoid them and so on. But uh, uncertainty is all the unknown unknowns. Those are all the things that we didn't even dream that could be possible and sometimes they happen. So uh, and it's, I think uh, Nassim Taleb is uh, one of the philosophers that, that um, stressed this very much that most of reality is in the in that sphere, the, the unknown unknowns. And also from my physics background, I, I think there were times during um, the history of physics that people were sure that, okay, this is the end of physics. We, we know almost everything about the world and nothing else. And then uh, a couple of years later, some, some kind of discovery was made that switched everything around, put everything on its head. The quantum physics is, is a great example. And, uh, at the end of the 19th century, it was still Newtonian physics that was uh, the main uh, model uh, of how the world works, and everyone believed in it, and everyone said, "Yeah, this is uh, we know uh, almost everything about the world." And then just a couple of things did not fit. Uh, did not fit. Uh, there was the the constant speed of light. Uh, uh, there was some electrodynamics experiments that did not fit. And then when they started uh, checking. They started experimenting more. They, they they discovered that there's a whole new world uh, behind that. That there's physics of relativity. There is quantum physics, and and, and it opened up a, a box of new discoveries. And and today we have this uh, we have this notion that we don't know anything about the world. There's uh, millions of things we don't know. So so I think this is uh, an important truth that you need to acknowledge in investing, and uh, you need to prepare for. If, however you can, that um, there will not only be uh, times uh, during the, the investment period that were similar to, to what was in the past, but there will also be very, very surprising times. Okay, so I think that especially as a quant investor, sometimes we may be very relaxed because we see the back-tested results and it seems to be fine. It even maybe seems to be fine in the real market. And uh, the problem is that we don't know what we don't know. So how can we prepare for these unknown things? Uh, is it even possible to, in some way, to be prepared for it if we don't know even for what to be prepared? 
Yeah, well, this is an open question, actually. There are a lot of people thinking about this and working on this. Uh, one of the uh, solutions I think is, is very useful for a, for an individual investor, and one, one I believe in, is simplicity. So mm -hmm. usually when you have a quantitative system, you have some kind of algorithms, the more complex you make them, the less... Uh, um, the more fragile the, they will be. They, they will be less resilient to um, different outcomes. So, so one of the best, I think, solutions is, is if you are constructing quantitative systems, make them as easy as possible. Uh, simplicity just helps along the way. The, uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and, and the uh, drawdown and the, 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 the quick rebound, I think, is a great example. Because uh, a lot of complex systems failed during this uh, market environment, and a lot of uh, also quantitative simple systems did very well. So, so this was this was one of the examples. Whereas the um, typical reaction to people when I present uh, some models, even as a blogger and podcaster, uh, the first reaction to uh, um, the people they 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 present is that they would like to improve it, they would like to make it more complex, and they have the feeling that if 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 you have more let's say moving parts in your model then it's uh, working probably it will work probably better whereas the the opposite quite often is is uh, is true especially that as a quantitative um uh, as a quant that there's a risk that we also uh, do too much digging into the uh, data and as they say it, uh uh, if you torture the data as long as you can, it will confess you to anything. So there is something in it as well. But on top of these things we just discussed, uh, there are also uh, other traps you mentioned in your presentation, namely the um, cognitive biases. Um, so if you could quickly just uh, explain what it is and is there any way to protect ourselves against them? Well, exactly. Just like you said, uh, I think this uh, notion that adding uh, more parts will make it better is one of the co uh, cognitive bias uh, that, the, uh, that there exists. I think uh, there's a great example in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that when people had a, um, I think there was some kind of survey, some kind of question, and when, when they were given more uh, details about the person, they believed that uh, it is more probable than that than she or he is, is something. And uh, when in reality, it's a, it's exactly the opposite. The, the less you know, the, the the bigger the probability is. So there, there's one of the, the um, it's one of the um, cognitive biases. There, there are, there's a plethora of biases that are mind uh, experiences. We haven't evolved for the uh, data market, for the financial markets. We have evolved to survive in the real physical world. So all these biases helped us survive in the physical world, but they prevent us from, from being uh, better, I think, investors today. Uh, and um, for me, Personally, uh, the quantitative approach is one of the ways to cope with these biases. So I think uh, different people have different methods of uh, because I, uh, of, uh, of dealing with them. Because I think uh, as a discretionary investor, you could also deal with these biases when you uh, spend on when you have uh, a lot of time and experience on the market. Uh, you can train yourself to to do proper things to to. To not panic in a in a very um, scary market, or or to 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 panic when when nobody panics, uh, it's it's I think it's doable, uh, but it's very very hard work, and it's uh, a very psychological uh, I think self growth experience. You have to put very very much very tough work into this. And uh, an easier approach for me is uh, um, a quantitative approach because that uh, that way you you delegate some of this uh, some of these problems to to the machine that that tells you no you have to buy right now you don't have to uh, think you don't have to um, analyze if, if this is a good time or a bad time you just have to buy because historically this works but also as you said uh, you have to watch out for overfitting yes uh, you have to make this uh, algorithm as simple as possible because um, another trap and another bias is overfitting. So it's, it's, it's hard, but it's doable, I think. All right. So just to draw some conclusions uh, from what we discussed already so far, 
uh, as your presentation is titled how can a widely known investment strategy still work and be profitable so um why are the strategies that are publicly known uh, they uh, still continue to be profitable do you think that for example uh, what uh, Wes Gray told on, uh, said on my podcast uh, interview that uh, he believes that, uh, for example, value works just because for the reasons w <laughs> for which people think it doesn't, uh, meaning that there's no pain, no gain. I mean, just because it's so hard to uh, handle such a strategy, follow such strategy, because you have to be prepared for a long uh, period of time of underperformance that uh, this is a very strong factor which will just uh, make people to not believe into the strategy and and uh, paradoxically this is why the strategy works uh what, what is your view on that topic i totally agree this, this what you said is, is is the main i think um, problem that people forget in investing that each uh, investment approach be it value investing be it passive investing be it whatever else uh, will have drawdowns. It will have uh, volatility and it will have uh, scary moments that you will have to live through and you have to be disciplined to stay with this with these uh, methods then because when people, the more people uh, uh, um, abandon these methods, the, the, the great their future prof prof profitability is. I think uh, Cliff Asnes uh, ha has a very interesting article on this and this is one of the inspirations behind this, uh, this presentation. The, uh, it's similarly titled, it's titled um, How Can a Strategy Everyone Knows About Still Work? It's uh, in the references there in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, uh, it's a little bit more technical, but I think uh, it's a great perspective on, uh, um, on why, uh, for example, the value factor can be uh, working in the long run. All right. I think that even the passive investment is not that easy as it seems to be because um, and a good example could be the COVID-19 last year in March 2020, because when the um, stock market is in, a, is, in, is in a free fall, let's say, and then you have a signal to rebalance and to buy more these stocks, although you are a passive investor, it's very hard to do it because you have to do uh, the opposite than the um, majority of the market participants. So, so I think that that this is uh, this is even there uh, a great example that passive investment maybe works just because it's not that uh, easy. Or as the Warren Buffett says, it's simple but not easy. Uh, so I think that indeed the uh, behavioral aspects they have uh, some uh, some uh, important uh, meaning there. On the other hand. I don't know what's your view on that, but I think that if there would be a strategy which is very simple, and and you you and you know and it's easy from the emotional point of view, that that strategy could uh, quickly erode because if someone I mean too many people would follow it, uh, the, the the strategy will not be that profitable. And do you think that indeed if more people will follow momentum or value, do you think that? Uh, efficiency of such uh, prof profitability of such uh, strategy will also erode in time i do actually uh, this is one of the things i have discussed in the presentation that uh, the the edge uh, of the strategy will be pro probably will be lower but it usually is not depleted uh, the, the strategy will probably be very good in the long run but 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 uh, every uh, strategy has its better and worse times to invest in and uh, one of the uh, charts I, I've shown there is, is the, um, the MSCI World Growth Index versus the MSCI uh, World Value Index. This is the ratio on the on the um, lower chart. And as you've seen, uh, usually in in some um, extreme market environments like the dot-com bubble or or um, before uh, the 1987 crash. Uh, there, there was some extreme uh, uh, value of this ratio, and uh, this is not a prediction. I, I, I have no idea if this ratio already had a, a maximum, a local maximum, or it will go very much higher. It, it, it can well go very much higher, but but usually there is some um, depletion. There, there is some overcrowding on e e each of the strategies, and right now maybe uh, uh, value is is abandoned by very very many investors so it's uh, 
a, a better maybe long-term strategy and momentum may be overcrowded, but time will tell. It's not something I know about. Uh, oh. When you mentioned um, the, uh, um, the informational uh, um, edge of a strategy, I, I, I remember that uh, you didn't discuss uh, the, the very important thing Michael Madison said that uh, informational uh, edges are just one of the four types of edges present on the market. The other analytical, behavioral, and technical edges. And uh, I'd say at least three of the, the, the last three of these, uh, they will not, uh, in my opinion, they will not um, disappear from the market. So, for example, uh, behavioral edge, uh, so, for example, the, the ability to, to buy drawdowns when, when the market is scary, I think this will probably always be a useful strategy just because our psychological um, makeup is that uh, most people can't do it. Yes, uh, maybe a lot of people that are into passive investing will uh, manage to, to, to buy drawdowns, but, but most people just just are not built for it. So I think th these other types of edges will persist in a very, very long time, just uh, at least as long as the human nature is what it is. So we could say that uh, someone with a strong stomach uh, is in a better position. That we, I mean, the, the strong stomach helps on the market uh, to, to, to um, exploit, let's say, this uh, behavioral um, uh, biases, uh, which most people have. Yes, but even the strong, uh, sh uh, strong stomach person will have uh, very, very hard times ahead of them because even uh, uh, the buy the dip strategy, it doesn't work always. It, it's, it works sometimes, it maybe works most of the time, but sometimes you will have to weather a very, very large drawdown. And what is also uh, an important issue that uh, we haven't discussed is that all of these different strategies, the passive investing or some, some smart beta, factors or something more complicated, they have drawdowns usually in different times. So uh, for example, when the whole market is, is drawdown and everyone around you has a drawdown, it may be a lot easier to, to weather this drawdown because you know that everyone is losing money and so on. But when you are in an environment like value right now, that, that everything is going great, that the market has, makes new all time highs and, and you are the only one experiencing drawdown, it's a lot, lot harder. So I think this is one of the, the, the reasons why factor investing works in the long term, that they have uh, usually um, drawdowns in different times. So it's harder to stick to these strategies in a disciplined, systematic way. So I see it that way that whoever is willing to use an active approach needs to be prepared to look differently than the market. And I think that this, that can be a, a, a big deal because uh, if someone tells you uh, just today, I noticed that from 2000, uh, 2009, uh, S&P compounded return is uh, over 16%. And if, on the other hand, you have a, an active investor who is having less, then, you know, you look differently, then it's very easy to, uh, to start thinking if my strategy still works. Um, so, so I think that it's unavoidable that when we are doing active, when we are using active approach, that, that there will be times, and it will be even more often than, uh, than less, that we will look differently than the market. And it, it can be very difficult, I think, for, for an investor. Um, on your website, I also found an article dedicated to cryptocurrencies, um, which I will link uh, um, uh, uh, under this interview. Could you please tell us more how you see, first of all, that new asset class? I'm calling it asset class because apparently it is. And do you think it's, an, uh, it's a bubble or uh, it will go, as they say, to the moon? And um, yeah, let's start from that. Well, definitely it is a new asset class. It's a very exciting asset class. There is a lot going on there. There's not only the, all the, the new cryptocurrencies, but everything around them, the, the NFTs, the, the um, using of blockchain in, in um, for example, the financial, financial sector. So I think it's a very interesting uh, asset class, but personally, I do not invest in uh, crypto assets. And uh, as a fund, we also cannot, from regulation, uh, perspective, we, we cannot invest into this new asset class right now. So for me, it's more uh, of an experiment ongoing that I am observing uh, 
uh, from the outside and I'm very curious how it will end. Uh, I thought it was, an, uh, it, it was a stock bubble and it, it was a, a, a asset bubble of the crypto uh, currencies in, in late 2017. And it did crash, but it turned out it just went higher from, from there on. So what happens next? I have no idea. Uh, I made the strategy uh, uh, in the article you noted, uh, a, a very simple one. It's, uh, it, it just uses an idea um, I borrowed from uh, Jesse Livermore of uh, Philosophical Economics. I hope you will link uh, his article uh, uh, in will, the yeah. interview. Because uh, he explains uh, in a very theoretical way how, uh, in general, uh, a, a moving average strategy can work. Uh, why does it work and, and when does it work and when has it, uh, when it has a a hard time and in general uh, whenever an asset is trending very strongly uh, both sides uh, to the upside and then to the downside uh, are using an, a moving average strategy is very useful and i've just done it as an experiment to, to, to see how it will work on the cryptocurrency market but uh, personally i am not using this strategy i am not investing personally in crypto uh, cryptocurrencies and i'm just watching from the outside with curiosity all right but do you think that this uh, rate of returns, the compounded annual uh, return on the on the even on the strategy you presented. I don't remember now exactly the numbers, but it was huge, uh, something crazy like hundred percent or even more per year. Do you think that that rate of returns is possible to 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 keep in the future? Uh, because you know uh, there are some limits. I mean. Uh, quite soon, we can end up in the situation where where uh, investors from the cryptocurrencies they would just uh, uh, you know suck all the money from the market. So how how do you see that? No, I I totally don't uh, believe that these uh, numbers will hold. Uh, I, I also uh, mentioned that in, in the conclusions of the article. I think that the, the compounded uh, averages are, are cosmic. They are <laughs> they are astronomical and. Uh, also, you have to separate two things that uh, I think a lot of people in the crypto uh, um, asset sphere that they, they sometimes forget that there is the technology and there is the investment uh, uh, of cryptocurrencies. And I think the technology is a great thing and it will uh, probably transform uh, uh, some, some parts of the um, business world and it will probably evolve, but uh, that doesn't mean that it will be a good investment in the long term. So uh, the, there's the example of railroads in the 19th century or, or airlines in the early 20th century, or even I think uh, uh, the internet companies. I don't know if, uh, uh, if it's around the, the, the dot-com bubble or earlier, but usually they have not been very great investment. The, the, the technology was great and it transformed our lives. And today we are using trains and, uh, and, and planes and, and internet and so, so on. And I think um, a similar case may happen with uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so the, the blockchain, the, the, the crypto um, currencies may be in use in, uh, in a couple of years from now. They may be very uh, popular, but that does not mean that uh, the investments will, will be very, very uh, good. They, they will have very big returns. So personally, I, I, I'm just curious. I, I'm skeptical, but I'm curious. But hypothetically, if you would have to invest in the cryptocurrencies, uh, would you prefer to have an approach of, you know, just to buy it and hold it forever? Or would you put some risk management in place? Because you mentioned that risk management, in fact, is much more important than, you know, a, a signal. Let's say that, that you would have just one signal, buy and hold forever because it will go to the moon. Would you prefer rather uh, than that approach to use some risk management and, uh, let's say, leave the market once there is a signal to leave it? Definitely. I, I definitely some, use some kind of risk management. And I think the, the moving average approach is just a simplest uh, way to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I even have a more complicated model. Uh, I didn't publish it because I didn't want to complicate things on the uh, on the article. But uh, maybe even making some kind of more complicated models would be useful, but not very much. Uh, I think the, the the main part of risk management here in in a trending asset is, is the moving average, and uh, I definitely use that if I would decide to to, to invest in cryptocurrencies. And I think, I mean, that's my personal uh, opinion only. Um, so not everyone has to agree with it. I think that majority of the investors also 
um, uh, with the cryptocurrencies, uh, they don't have any real plan, any strategy. So once there will be a really um, a, a great bear market, a lot of them just will be wiped out because they don't have really a plan how to exit from the market. So I think that, again, the be behavioral aspects will play a huge role also on the cryptocurrencies or may or maybe even especially there because the volatility is 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 extreme there okay um so uh for your personal uh investments uh what kind of strategies do you use i first of all i have some regulations because as i'm working in the fund i i, I can't uh, buy everything i want uh, on the investment market but uh, I have some flexibility and in my private investments, I use a s simple strategy that I've made. So these are just quantitative strategies I've made for myself. Uh, I would I would recommend them, but uh, uh, they are, I, the, most of them I think uh, uh, would be useful for, for most people, but as I'm working in the fund, uh, I cannot, uh, Invest sure. other people's money uh, outside the fund. So uh, in, in our fund, Apocaquant, we are using more complex algorithms, but I'd say the main idea is probably similar. Uh, they are the result of our work for, I don't know, the last couple, four, five years. So definitely I'd recommend those. Uh, but the, the problem is that we are uh, focused mainly on uh, a little bit richer clients, so so they are not open funds. In, in Poland, we have something like open funds and closed funds, and, and these are uh, a closed type of investment funds. So they are not for everybody, but uh, yes, I, I recommend them. All right, uh, we are reaching to the end of this interview. Uh, if you if you'd have to provide a single best investment advice, what would that be? I know it's I, a hard one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd say that the, the most important uh, virtue of, an, of a successful investor is uh, discipline, consequence, and systematic, uh, a systematic approach. It doesn't even have to be a programmable systematic approach. It could be a discus discretionary investor that, that is very systematic in his work. But I think consequence and discipline is very, very hard. Uh, um, it's, and it's very, very important. Uh, once you master this skill, I think uh, investing will be a lot, lot easier. Right. So we do try to find some complex solutions. And it's very difficult for us as a human beings to appreciate simple solutions. And I think that if we are looking for some gold uh, buried, uh, we should go towards that direction. I mean, simplicity. Okay, is there anything right. else you'd like to add to before we quit uh, today's interview? Well, most of all, I'd, I'd like to, to link the, these articles that I've uh, quoted. I will. So, so, so Mr. Asnes, uh, Mr. Mabelson, I think there's a great article from Morgan Housel uh, uh, that there's, it's called The Psychology of Money. He also- The book, uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he also wrote a book later with the same title, but I think even the article that is shorter is, is, is very good for uh, aspiring active investors yeah. because it focuses on a, a lot of uh, maybe not biases, but but uh, ideas that are uh, very important to remember as an investor. So uh, I'd very much like you to, to call these in. Uh, also, the, the article from Philosophical Economist, I think is very useful explaining uh, the moving average strategy. Okay. And what's the best way to reach you? If someone would like to contact you, what's the best way to do this? Well, I think there are two ways. The, the easiest way is, is LinkedIn. I have an account on LinkedIn there. And if you prefer an email exchange, it's my name.surname at gmail.com. Okay. I will put all these details uh, in the show notes. So whoever is interested, uh, all the information uh, can be found there. Uh, Grzegorz, thank you very much for your time. I think that you shared with us a lot of wisdom, a lot of value, so I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me. You're and welcome. All the best to you too. You're welcome. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.